Our guest speaker for today is Mr. Michael Ng. Mr. Michael is the assistant manager from the ESG department at the Malaysian Pop All Council, MPOC. In this first session with MPOC, among the topic of discussion would be on the ESG challenges for the plantation industry, particularly with reference to issues like the EUDR, meeting net zero targets, and the like from an industry perspective. Once again, if you have any questions for Mr. Michael Ng after his presentation, you may type out questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Without further ado, I will now like to invite and hand over the mic to our moderator for today, Ms. Ho Li Ling, Regional Sector Head, RHB Investment Bank Berhad, to lead the session. Over to you, Li Ling. Thanks so much, Farah. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, yeah, is, we are very pleased to have, uh, you know, such great esteemed speakers. Um, you know, I uh, just wanted to correct something. Uh, we are doing only the Q&As at the end of all three sessions. Uh, so we won't have a Q&A after each session, but at the end of all three sessions, and we'll be doing that in a panel form. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, let me invite uh, Michael. Uh, Michael, over to you. Thank you. So just let me share my screen now. Okay. Right. So first of all, thank you for your kind introduction and a very good morning to everyone present here today. On behalf of MPOC, I would like to express our appreciation to RHB Bank for inviting us to this webinar. And in this 45 minutes presentation slot that we have here, we will try and share with you our insights and analysis on the current sustainability challenges faced by the Malaysian palm oil industry, in particular, the EUDR. So here we have the presentation topics that I've outlined today. We'll start off with an overview of the Malaysian palm oil industry, followed by the sustainability efforts undertaken in the industry before we dive right into the central focus of our presentation today, which is the EUDR legislation. So with this, let us go through some key information on the Malaysian palm oil industry. So here's a snapshot of the Malaysian palm oil industry. And firstly, the total planted area of oil palm in Malaysia is recorded at 5.6 million hectares. So this takes up about 17% or about one fifth of Malaysia's total land area. All of this amount, Small this form about 26% of Malaysia's total oil palm planted area. And it's estimated that there's about 450,000 smallholders in Malaysia. And if you add in the other communities as well, we'll be looking at a figure of more than half a million of smallholders in Malaysia. Next, we have here the oil palm planted area amongst the regions, peninsulas, Malaysia, Sabah, and Sarawak. And this information shared here on land use, production, and smallholders in Malaysia will be important points for discussions in the next few sections when it comes to meeting key requirements under UDR and shaping the outcome of Malaysia's engagement with the EU. So to end this overview section, here's a comparison of the Malaysian palm oil industry's land use footprint from a global perspective. It is only occupying about 0.12% of the total global agricultural land. And it doesn't really reflect the scale and magnitude of the scrutiny Malaysia has received on its perceived impacts on global deforestation and climate change. Again, these are key questions that will be raised in our EDR engagements later on. Now, this brings us to the next chapter on the sustainability issues and challenges in the industry. And these are often interlinked because most of the time, the focus is often drawn towards developing countries. But in reality, it is the market demands, especially for unsustainable commodities that drives global deforestation. As one of the largest economy in the world, the EU is primary consumer for agricultural commodities. However, its demands has really led to an increased production of these commodities which has then resulted in an expansion of agricultural land globally. And these expansions have been identified as the main driver 
for deforestation and forest degradation. Here, Hamo is one of these communities linked to the sustainability debate. In order to address the stakeholders and markets' concerns on these issues, sustainability efforts through development of certification schemes have been established, followed by policies such as on the NDP on no deforestation. Here, the RSPO certification scheme has gained prominence as the world's first sustainability certification scheme for both the palm oil and the oil seed sector. As for our national efforts, Malaysia first released its national standards for sustainable palm oil in 2013. And two years later, a voluntary national scheme was based on these standards known as the MSPO certification scheme before this was made mandatory in 2017. This is again to ensure that the entire Malaysian palm oil industry can be successfully produced and certified in order to address the increasing complex challenges and requirements in the global market. This also enables a market alternative to RSPO for both producers and buyers of certified sustainable palm oil. We're now very close to achieving full certification with 96% of the Malaysian palm oil industry already MSPO certified. And the revised MSPO standard just introduced last year, which comes with more stringent requirements on deforestation, climate change, and workers' welfare, plus the improvements in the MSPO supply chain traceability system, known as the MSPO trace, will help ensure that the industry is well equipped to meet the current and emerging sustainability requirements in the global market. When it comes to biodiversity conservation efforts, the Malaysian palm oil industry has really come a long way. From having a conservation fund back in 2006, which was entirely dependent on industry and government matching grants, it is now a fully fledged foundation, which was established just two years ago and is financed by the Palm Oil Industry SES Fund. The MPO GCF is now the focal point for the Malaysian palm oil industry's conservation efforts. Major initiatives under its care include the Bonin Elephant Sanctuary and the One Million Tree Planting in Sabah, as well as the Malayan Tiger Conservation Program in Peninsular Malaysia. So finally, I have here some examples of the industry's recent ESG initiatives. These are only some of the examples and efforts and there are a number of major efforts in the industry that can be accessed through the plantation companies' integrated or sustainability reports. So we have here industry initiatives on conservation efforts, for example, the FGV Holdings Malayan Sun Bear Conservation Program. This is in collaboration with the Malaysian Nature Society or MNS, Pohilitan and UKM. We have here also no deforestation pledges and commitments, for example, the NDPE by plantation companies. Commitments to human rights and forced labor, which needs to be really given serious attention because it not only impacts the exports of companies affected in the case of the US CBP, but it also causes reputational damage to both the industry as well as the countries impacted. These are more examples of the industry's efforts in addressing the forced labor issue. For MPOC, we have been in continuous engagement with the US authorities, including the US CDP, in addressing the forced labor issues. And we have conducted a number of training programs in collaboration with Suhakam, ILO, and MPOCC to increase the industry and especially the smallholders' awareness on human rights and forced labor. Finally, some examples of efforts to improve the governance aspect by the plantation companies. So we now move to the main focus of the presentation today, which is the European Union Deforestation Regulation or EUDR in short. In this chapter, we will go through its background, objectives and requirements. As we have discussed earlier, the EU's demand for agricultural commodities has led to an increased production globally. 
And this has been identified by the EU as the main driver for global deforestation. And recognizing its impacts here, the EU Commission has proposed a regulation uh, in 2021 to address this issue. And after a period of deliberation since, the legislation was finally formalized in the form of the EU Deforestation Free Regulation or EUDR. What are EUDS objectives here? It seeks to minimize EU's contribution to deforestation and forest degradation by curbing product supply chains with deforestation risks and elements from entering the EU market. At the same time, it intends to increase demand for deforestation free and legal communities of products in the EU market. We have here key EUDR requirements that will affect producing countries and exporters the most. There are a number of articles in the EUDR, about 30 plus, but here are the main articles that will actually impact the farm industry and exporters. First of all, we have Article 3, which is the basis of the regulation where commodities and derivatives needs to be deforestation free, legal and covered with a due diligence statement. Next, Article 8 is on how companies needs to demonstrate that their products are both deforestation and forest degradation free and legal through a due diligence statement. Information on this, on the preparation of the statement can be found in Annex 2 of the regulation. Article 9 refers to the information that companies are required to collect. This includes geographical information on the commodity's source of origin to be checked for compliance. And finally, Article 29, which is the contentious country benchmarking system, where countries or parts thereof will be assessed on an unilateral basis by the EU on their level of risk of deforestation and forest degradation. What it means is that companies sourcing commodities and derivatives from high risk areas would require high inspection levels and subjected to more assessments and risk mitigations. And no risk areas require only simplified due diligence in the form of information collection. So in total, there are about 38, 38 articles in UDR. And for you to access these complete text and articles, it can be found in the official UDR regulation published within the EU website. Finally, we have here the list of impacted commodities the full list of the commodities and its relevant products or derivatives can also be found in the published regulation under the, the section of Annex 1. Although the US stated that there's no discrimination and it will impose similar requirements on this list of commodities if they are grown in the EU, do note that most of these commodities are actually produced in tropical countries who are also mainly developing countries. And we have here the UDR timeline. With the UDR already entered into force since 29 June 2023, the industry and stakeholders now have about 15 months left of preparations before stakeholders must comply. So what is pending now is the implementing act, which spells out the full details, rules, and process required in implementing the UDR rules and regulations. And this includes the classification mechanism for the country benchmarking system, which will be critical for producing countries like Malaysia. The big question here, how significant is the UDR for Malaysia? Can we just afford to simply brush it aside? Yes, it will be significant, as the EU is the third largest market for our Malaysian palm oil. Of Malaysia's 137 billion export value recorded last year for palm oil and palm oil products, about 17 about 17 percent is to the EU market. If we add up all the commodities impacted by EUDR, for example, timber, rubber, and cocoa, the total export value will be increased to 29 billion ringgit Malaysia.
But then again, the impacts here are not confined to trade values. As the UDL requirements is bound to increase costs and create barriers for the Malaysian farmer sector, including its 450,000 smallholders, if Malaysia is designated as a high-risk country. And this will ultimately increase poverty, reduce household incomes, and harm Malaysia's rural communities, which are not outcomes that align to the EU's commitments outlined in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Now, with the key details on EUDR and its importance to Malaysia now clearer, let's move on to the next chapter. What are the main constraints for the Malaysian farmer industry in meeting its requirements? We have identified five major concerns that will impact the industry the most. Firstly, when it comes to the deforestation and deforestation-free definition and prohibition in Article 2 and 3 respectively. This will be an issue for non-MSPO certified stakeholders. But in general, the MSPO revised version enables Malaysia to demonstrate compliance to the required cut off date requirement. There could be potential issues as well for MSPO group certifications though, if a single smallholder does not meet EODR requirements. Secondly, the geolocation information under Article 8. Currently, the MSPO trace platform only contains simple geolocation information for each certified estate or mills. And this platform needs to be upgraded to ensure it's able to store and share polygon data, which should be compliant to the EODR requirements. In addition, our smallholders will also require further technical and financial assistance in order to provide the required information. Thirdly, traceability and transparency of supply chain, which falls under Article 8, and 10. Operators and traders need to ensure that its commodities and relevant product supply chain is traceable and transparent. Here, when it comes to MSPO, we found that only MSPO segregated supply chain will qualify, while its mass balance supply chain will not, as the EODR does not allow any mixing of certified and non certified sources. For certain palm-based products, for example, the oleochemicals products, its supply chain could be further complex as its products are produced with raw materials from possibly different mills or even countries of origin. Finally, Article 34 review. It is stated in the regulations that there is a potential and possibility for the regulation scope to be extended to include also additional natural ecosystems such as high carbon stocks, land with high carbon stocks, and land with high biodiversity value. And this will take place no later than June 2025. And it means from then onwards, you have a larger scope when it comes to the EUDR coverage and it will impact more land and it will impact more developing countries. Lastly, the, the most contentious section really of the EUDR is Article 29 when it comes to the country benchmarking system. What we know so far is that the classification is based primarily on the following criteria. The rate of deforestation, the rate of expansion of the agri agricultural land for relevant communities, as well as production trends of relevant communities and relevant products. However, we need more information as there are still a number of uncertainties on the exact mechanism in how countries or its regions will be classified until the Implementing Act is released next year. In our latest engagements with the EU, we have been informed that the mechanism and criteria will only be shared with producing countries like Malaysia once it is finalized. And this is again a concern as producing countries like Malaysia we have very little inputs on how the feasibility and how inclusive the mechanism is.
There's also a lot of stake here as a high risk classification for a country to subject one particular country to a higher rates of audit checks. In addition, this will also create reputational damage to the state country and raise another non tariff barrier as other important countries or markets with similar sustainability and due diligence requirements will favor purchasing commodities from countries identified as low risk. So now we have come to the final chapter of our presentation today, which is our efforts in addressing EODR. In order to address the EODR challenges and ensure an unrestricted trade access for Malaysian palm oil, MPOC and the Malaysian government has been engaging the EU industry members and CPOXI to ensure that Malaysia can be classified as a low risk country. In addition, MSPO is to be accepted as a tool in meeting the EUDR requirements. And finally, its communities to enjoy access to the EU markets without any additional barriers and costs. In order to achieve these objectives, we have since carried out a number of unilateral and bilateral engagements and campaigns. This include supporting the Malaysian smallholders in their petition against UDR, assessing the MSPO readiness in meeting the UDR requirements. Also here, we also have here the much publicized joint mission in Malaysia and Indonesia to Brussels early in May, where this is one of the few occasions that both countries are united in a common stand against UDR, despite, despite being competing producing countries. MPOC also facilitated stakeholders engagement session with the DGNV in end July, where significant concerns amongst the industry were conveyed to the EU. Despite the publication of the EU FAQ or frequently asked questions just in June, which attempted to address concerns related to the interpretation and definitions of these requirements, a number of substantial concerns on its implementation mechanism have still yet to be answered. This is particularly true for the Malaysian farm industry due to its complex supply chain, which creates a challenging situation in the preparation of the due diligence statement information, as well as its traceability requirements. What are the current outcomes so far? One of the more positive outcomes is the formation of the joint task force between Malaysia, Indonesia, and the European Commission to facilitate the implementation of UDR. And key areas in this task force collaboration will be to assess the MSPO and help enhance the scheme to ensure that it can be one of the selection tools to be accepted by the EU in meeting the UDR requirements. For us, we hope that this platform will help facilitate our efforts to be designated as a low-risk country under the UDR's country benchmarking system, as well as recognition of our sustainability subduction schemes. We are of the belief that the Malaysian Sustainable Palm Oil Subduction Scheme, or MSPO, is rigorous and credible enough to demonstrate our commitments in combating deforestation and be recognized and accepted for use in the UDR's due diligence statement as well. What's the second current outcome? What we have here is that the national commitments and efforts on forest conservation has really paid off. And this is really crucial to ensure that Malaysia meets the requirements of a low risk country. Malaysia is firmly committed to addressing illegal deforestation and its adverse impacts to the environment and local communities. And this commitment has also been echoed by the Malaysian farming industry, where Malaysian companies are now leading the way in driving sustainability 
through their commitments such as NDPE, which is now a standard across the major palm oil plantation companies. And as shared earlier, the results of these commitments are really showing. First, we have the FAO Forest Reserve Assessment back in 2020, which reported a decline when it comes to deforestation rates in Malaysia and the increase of forest cover for Malaysia as well. And we have the recent data from World Resource Institute, which has demonstrated that Malaysian deforestation rates are declining and this is in the right direction of reducing deforestation. We are now at the global forefront in the effort to end deforestation, protect its natural biodiversity and forests, while prioritizing sustainable development and economic opportunity. Commitments and actions by the industry, the government and the other stakeholders is real and is working on the ground. In conclusion to my presentation today, it seems that Malaysia, MSPO, and our efforts is on the right track in achieving the EUDR requirements. However, it has to be noted that Malaysia is still cautiously optimistic that we will be able to meet our EUDR requirements. And we also recognize that we need further and meaningful consultations and engagements with the EU and from the EU to assist the country and the industry, especially the small orders, to comply. We also note that there will be a number of upcoming sustainability link regulations in the EU. As EU moves towards achieving its goal to be a climate neutral continent by 2020 under its Green Deal. And the key concerns will be linked again to deforestation climate change, traceability, and workers' well-being. To address these concerns and upcoming regulations, Malaysia and MPOC will be intensifying its efforts to promote MSPO as a tool to address these key concerns, as well as to engage EU and relevant stakeholders to ensure that our concerns and constraints can be communicated well. Finally, Adoption of technology by the industry will also be crucial in meeting these emerging challenges as there are a number of requirements when it comes to supply chain, due diligence, traceability, and transparency. So with this, I now end my presentation today.